Now to welcome us to this space, I am honored to introduce Ken Workman, a descendant of Chief Seattle and a council member of the Duwamish tribe. This word, this word means a long time ago. And this language that you hear me talking is the language of my great, 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 great grandfather, Chief Seattle. It's also the language that we were forbidden from speaking for so very long. But we're starting to talk once again. And so it's an honor to stand on this stage in front of you here today and be able to say in my own language and in my own way, it's nice to see you. So, Hatsaslav de Bitsi, the CIA, Saskodidisha, Todagui Bashida, Hate Shucks, Ah, Seattle, Aslak Hill. It simply means, hey, thanks for driving on the streets to get here today. <coughs> By way of formal introduction, Yayus means work and Stobes means man. So, Yayus, Stobes, Tidda, Hata Dawabs. I am workman of the Duwamish tribe. And great, 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 great grandson of Chief Seattle. And so just as my grandfather, this person that the world knows as Seattle, stood on the shores of Alki Beach, not a handful of miles away from here, and he says, Come ashore, my friends, onto this land of the Duwamish. This is what he was doing in 1851 when he welcomed the Denny family to this place. And on not that day, the world turned upside down for the Duwamish people. That was the introduction of a modern society with these tall ships and these muskets and axes and things like that. And so Seattle is a very, very new city. We as native people have been here for thousands and thousands of years. And we have stories of days when it was cold, and then it's not. And so when we're out here and we're talking about this place, this is who we are. We are part of this place. We're in the ground. We're in the trees. We're in the air. We're in the rivers. So it's my honor to stand before you today and utter these words, the same words that my grandfather said in 1851, when he said, La Leodisia Adisha Padatea Come ashore, my friends, onto this land of the Duwamish. That today, that we as Duwamish people recognize this place, this world, as a very small place. And so many people from all around the world live here today. And so we say thank you in as many ways as we can. And so we say gunochis to our Haida friends. We say hawa to our, to our, um, our, um, Haida is Hawa, Gunochish is Tlingit. And the Tlingit people are from Alaska. And then we say Deutschkum because the Simpson lived next to the Haida, up there north of the border for quite a ways. Around here we say Quidid. This word means thank you, and all of these words mean the same thing. They mean thank you. And so we express thanks as many ways as we can. And so we say Haiska Siem. Adisha Padate Dawabs, the same that the Lummi and the Sanich say from British Columbia. And so we say those very same words to you, and we say, we express our thanks, and we say, Thank you, my friends, for your hearts. Thank you, my friends, for your strength, for your work. Thank you, my friends for your lives and for being here today. And that you should know that on this day a Duwamish person stood before you and he uttered the words, the same words that were taken from us for so very long, when he said, Come ashore, my friends, onto this land of the Duwamish. This, this word, it means everybody is welcome here. And so we repeat this word three times. And so we say, Gui Gui Hedak, Gui Gui Hedak, Gui Gui Hedak. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Ken. And now we're going to see a short clip to set the tone of the evening and welcome you into the world of Sevilla Ford. Dancer and choreographer Sevilla Ford has made a great contribution to the world of dance in this country. As a member of the Catherine Dunham Dance Company, she performed many, many years and performed in the classic movie Stormy Weather. She has indeed given much to the world of dance. And tonight here at this theater, the world of dance and theater will give something back to her. Yeah, I did honor a lady who I knew a long time ago. And I've seen her work, you know, and I've seen the results of her work. And she's a very important woman. Without her, there would be no Catherine Dunham or Alvin Ailey and all of the fantastic dancers whom we have today. More silently, more tenaciously, and more graciously than almost anybody else I know on the face of the earth, made one of the most powerful contributions to, to the field of dance, the field of theater, and as a friend, as someone who has meant so much to all of our lives and was not to be asked to participate in this tribute to her tonight. Sevilla Fort began her career as a student at Cornish School, which is now known as Cornish College. To illuminate her legacy, we will hear more from Cornish College President, Dr. Raymond Timus Jones. Tonight, I am truly honored to be a part of this celebration of the life and legacy of Sevilla Fort as a dancer and leader in the world of dance. In its 109 years history, Cornish College of the Arts has trained and educated thousands of artists, citizens, and innovators. One of our most illustrious alums, of course, is the lady we are honoring tonight. Savella Ford. She completed her studies at Cornish in 1940. She was a contemporary of Merce Cunningham, as maybe perhaps many of you know. It was Jennifer Dunning who said that her, she was a noted choreographer and dance theorist of imagination and taste. Avinelli said that she was our inspiration. It was the foundation of being at Cornish, combining that with the influence of Catherine Dunham, that we had this tour de force to show up in New York City and to affect not only the students of the Dunham School, but affect the students of her own school. And her commitment to dance is reflected in this very short clip that we just saw. I didn't know much about, in fact, I didn't know anything about Sevilla Fort when I came to Seattle in 2018. But I had this wonderful lady to come to my office to share with me a vision that she had about a tribute to Sevilla. It was Miss Edna de Grey. She was so passionate and excited about telling me about this amazing dancer that I needed to know about who began her work at Cornish, and how could I not know that? And so I immediately became interested in learning more about this extraordinary person that had the woman visiting me so very excited and engaging. It was the beginning. 
One of the benefits of being a part of tonight's celebration is I have learned so much about her power and her presence. I am thankful that she had her beginnings at an institution that I now lead. Last, about four months ago, my vice president of advancement and I were sitting and having a conversation and there is a tremendous need for Cornish to be able to support students of color who come to Cornish. We have a successful representation of BIPOC students, but we can do so much more. And I want us to do so much more. And so in our conversation, we talked about a, a fund that we wanted to create and raise money for that would be an opportunity for us to support students of color both coming in as new students as well as students currently studying at Cornish. And the result of that conversation is the establishment of the Sevilla Ford Scholarship. It's long overdue, but it's better late than never. We are hopeful that we will be able, through our efforts in a, a campaign that we're currently conducting, to be able to raise sufficient funds that will be able to be distributed and support the students that we currently have that need financial assistance, as well as students who will be matriculating next year. I want to thank the organizers and planners of this program tonight for including me and including Cornish. We are honored to be a part. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raymond. That's wonderful news and really exciting. Now, um, we are very honored to take what we've seen on film and bring it into the room itself. Uh, Edna de Grey will now share more about Sevilla Fort's inspirational legacy from yesterday, uh, from yesterday, tomorrow, and today. And she invites audience participation with movements celebrating and experiencing isolation body movement with percussion. Uh, to accompany her on per percussion, we're honored to have Etienne Capo tonight, who is director and lead choreographer of Gonsango Dance Company. He teaches African dance classes at Open Flight Studio in Seattle and performs locally, nationally, and internationally. I have, am I, yeah, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, you know, I did not know Sevilla Fort. I learned about Sevilla Fort through Bill Monroe, who's a percussionist in New York. We brought him out here as an artist in residence in 1974. And he talked about Sevilla Fort to me. I didn't really know who she was. I was doing Catherine Dunham's. Finally, I was really interested in, in Sibylla Fort, her background, because I had opened my little dance studio, which was in Wallingford, called a Washoe, and uh, it was right in Wallingford and, and University District. And so I got an opportunity to go to New York and meet Sibylla Fort and sit in on her class. I didn't take the class, but it was like three hours, 10 percussionists, uh, cow, cow, cowbells, uh, the women drum, the men drum, everybody drum. And it was like a home. These people would, they wouldn't be all dancers. They would be a mixture of all kinds. It was the community dance. And uh, Sevilla was towards the end when I met her. I mean, she wasn't, uh, when she would teach a class, when there was a need to correct someone or they was overdoing it, she would touch them. And for some reason, 
they look at her and, and she, and she could, be, they could be corrected by just a touch. Because at that time, as you saw, that was uh, how she was dressed. So tonight, what we want to do is dance in unity. I always get the audience involved. Because without you, there is no dance. You know, there's, you have to keep moving. And you have to realize that you got a lot of joints in your body that you haven't moved for a while. Yeah, and we want to get those joints moving. And so you're going to be dancing in solitary unity. And guess who we have? We have some great people back to follow us. And they're going to talk and introduce themselves again. <laughs> but we're going to start. The first thing, I know you don't have much space, right? So that means that you're going to have to dance in place, which a lot of people say, well, I can't dance in my apartment or my condo or my house. I don't have the space. You're going to dance in your own space. So could you stand up and let's get busy? <laughs> the first thing is, this is Paul. We're going, to, we're going to start a simple thing like breathing. I want you to stand in this position. Then I want you to go into sort of like a first position, a phallic, then in a parallel. And we're going to take the breathing. <coughs> breathing is very important. So I want you to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. So as you breathe in, I want you to lift the torso, open, in other words, open the intercostal rib cage here, right? Open. You work in the diaphragmatic muscle. You know what that muscle is doing, right? And if you don't work that muscle, it goes into atrophy. So let's take a deep breath in and breathe out. This time as we breathe in, we're going to lengthen up through the body. And as we exhale, we're going to bend the knees a little bit. It's called a little demi-plie. Good. Down as low as you can go. Coming up for air, breathe in and out. Oxygen in and out. Let's do one more. Breathe in through the nose. Open and out. Thank you. Now we're going to start a little rhythm. We're going to do some isolation. Catherine Dunn's class was very interesting, and, and Sevilla taught that, uh, that class. And the class that I saw was the Afro Caribbean. It's on 44th Avenue Theater. I witnessed some movements that was incredible. And so tonight, in unity, we're going to do a little isolation movement. So there'd be no excuse for you not to have room. So just spread out. This is called parallel. OK, here we go. Let's take a little of the rhythm right now. It's called presentation. Okay, right here, just open. OK? And we're going to start with a little rhythm, starting with the shoulders. In other words, every joint of your body that I can possibly use, we're going to be doing that. OK, so here we go. Let's start the rhythm and one, two, three, four, and one. We're going to do a little bend of the knees. This is our rhythm. Two, one, two, one, two. Don't that feel good? Just bending the knees, <laughs> straightening them, keeping the back straight. One, two. Don't hold your breath. Good. Keep it going. Uh, now, can you keep that rhythm and start using another part of your body, which is going to be an isolation of the ball and socket shoulder joint? Up, back, back, up, front, front, up, back. Keep going. And back, up, front. I'm just watching you. You're still on the right shoulder. <laughs> and keep your presentation. Good. The other side. Now, front. Up, back, now back, up, front, again, front, up, 
again, front, up, back, back, up, front, there you go, two, watch your dances, both, and front, up, back, back, up, front, just take it easy on there, because you got it not too big, just soft, up the tempo now, one, two, one, two, one, two. Drop the arms and relax and I'm one, two. Up to the back. Go and squeeze the shoulder blades together. Yes. Now, front, front. Up, little up, upper body. to the head, move on the neck movement, up and down, up and down. Notice how slow it is so you can really get that nice breathing and stretching. Good. Head to the right. Look to the right and left and right and left. Keep the rhythm in the knees now. Can you do that? Keep your rhythm in your knees. And right. Oh, let it, okay, now let it roll around. Just slowly. At your own pace, just let your neck roll twice to the left. That's one. Do it again. That's two. And now just sort of shake the head. Just give it a little shake. 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 Good. We're going to go into the intercostal muscles, thoracic area of your spine. Demi plie. Move. Right. Center, right. Keep your presentation here. Got it? Keep it going. Up the tempo. Ready? And one. Isolation, just your little pelvis there, yeah? Don't get big in the body, okay? Try to keep your presentation here. Now you can move it up a little bit to the heart. 
to the side. Take it out. Don't that feel good? Just move it. Ha! Ha! Somebody's going, having a hard time. Good. To the left. Ah, you should know that. You should not do that. Keep it going. Ah. Okay, take it out. Now we want to do this. Take it right. Take it left. Take it right. Take it left. Presentation up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hey, that looks good. And getting a little loose now. I'm going to come up. Sit in the chair. Don't sit all the way down now. Bring that hip up. Shake those shoulders. Six, seven, sit. And up. Let me see. Sit. Two, three, four. Shake it up. Shake it. Shake it when you come up. Shake the whole body. Blood circulation. Blood circulation. Shake it here so you get some blood in it. Ooh. Yes. You have to get some blood here. You've been sitting too long. Let it go. Shake it out. Shake all over. Shake it all over. Shake, shake. Shake, shake, shake. All over. Shake, shake. Shake, 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 shake. Ha! And press. You enjoyed that? so much. That was amazing. <laughs> yes, big round of applause. And thank you to Akoya and Nia Mina for uh, accompanying. You'll see more from them later. So next, I'd like to welcome up Al Doggett, who is going to be talking about his process in creating the beautiful portrait of Sevilla Fort that you can see on the front of your programs. Well, I think I'm warmed up now. I want to hear some music. I'm ready. <laughs> anyway, I feel good tonight. And I'm really, really honored to have be here. I'm so happy to see that this is happening for Sevilla Fort. It's really amazing. Uh, I was very honored to be uh, commissioned to paint her portrait back in the early 1980s. For me, at that time, I didn't know who she was either. I wasn't familiar with her. As an artist, they wanted me to paint, to capture her life in a, in a painting. What I normally do in creating a portrait, first I have to get to know the person, get a feel for the subject, and my first step was, of course, getting out and doing research, finding out as much as I can about her, reading her biography. I went to the library, uh, University of Washington Library. They had an extensive file on her. I was able to read about her background, get a sense of who she was as a person, and also 
several photographs of her because I didn't really have a feel of what she looked like, what her, you know, the, the, her personality in a sense. So by going through the photos, going through her story, it started to develop in me how I really could capture some, capture her in a painting basically. And so what I do normally is get a sense of first how I want to capture her. I knew I was going to do a painting, an oil painting, it'd be about four, a 30 by 40 piece, and I wanted to compose it in a way that actually captured her life as much as it could. Now a lot of portrait, traditional portrait, is capturing the head and shoulders of someone, but I wanted to tell more of her story. And so I decided to do a montage creating images, different images of her life, different parts of her life. So some of the photos I got, I, I was able to put together pieces to kind of decide on how I would actually develop that, but telling her story in a sense. So that was the first step. And, but still, as I read about her, I started to get a feel for her as an artist, her as she started as a young, I mean, she was like six years old and she was like into dance. Myself, I was drawing pictures, paintings, and you know, when I was really uh, in the fifth grade. For me, art started at an early age, uh, drawing, uh, creating little comic book characters, that was part of my life, and just constantly. Fortunately, I had a lot of help, a lot of encouragement from my mother and family and friends in the neighborhood from Brooklyn. I captured a lot of stories from the, from the, from the people around me, basically, and that was in the neighborhood that I was in. That sort of inspired me to, to create. I love people. I wanted to capture that sense of who they were. So in sketching and drawing and then getting crayons uh, to start adding color to it. So my beginning, my beginning sort of happened like that. I was encouraged to study art, I did, uh, to just improve. I always wanted to create a story, basically. I did that through a lot of images that I've created uh, when I was young and in elementary school. I was a class artist at some point, and that was exciting because I was, able, I was able to create images from the lessons that we were learning on the chalk on the blackboard. That also just gave me more excitement to come up with my imagination and come up with different images that I could uh, create in different ways. I wanted to illustrate the story about specific stories that I was learning about. Going to some of the schools I did, I was able to progress a little better on, on some of my skills that I wanted to, and capturing the figure in different motions in different places. That was fun. I really enjoyed that, and I knew that art would stay with me the rest of my life, and I just, something that just made me feel good. It's like a way of creating through me, through my body, like when I dance, it's kind of, it's just a beautiful kind of, excitement that comes within me, and I just love it. So I'm going to show a couple of slides just from the beginning of how in creating a portrait, like I said, in getting to know someone, I've done several portraits of people. Normally what I try to do is talk to them, get to know them, sketch them from different positions, take different shots, profile. The old masters used to do that. They would actually take and have the portrait, have the person sit, they would take different angles of them. And little by little, you get to know them. You see the little, little personality is part, that's part of them. You want to capture who they are. For me, the eyes are really key. You can capture someone by their eyes. You just capture that, you can get their whole, the essence of who they are. And so that's one of my focuses, to really go that direction. Uh, I'm going to show some of the slides. Uh, Oh, you got this up already. The way I start, again, it was a big project, and I wasn't quite sure initially how I might pull it off doing a painting that large to capture. This is the first time I've done uh, a montage composition. That's using different elements and blending them together. A collage is a little different where you have pieces of images cut and paste, hard edges. This had to tell a story, had to blend together. So I had that in mind. So the first thing I do is sit down with a small piece of paper, and then I start to just 
it was my, my just thinking through how I might block it out, how I might block it out on paper. And as I'm doing that, I'm still thinking, thinking about how I pull this together for a completed painting. The second step was adding more detail eventually, and little by little, I'm still thinking about how I might want to place it. I'm changing. When you're doing sketches like this, you do a lot of thumbnail sketches to just get a feel for your direction, the composition that you want to go through. This is the point where I decided I knew my composition. I knew I wanted to have her main figure in the center and then have the various other elements come into the play there. That was something that I thought about and I tried many different ways of pulling that together to tell the story. Move to this. This is, once I had that done, this is not a good, clear, uh, strong image of color. Once I did the drawing, I had to decide on a color scheme. Well, what kind of color did I want? What I wanted a nice, warm, rich tones that would reflect her personality. And so I tried different color combinations together to say, okay, this is kind of a direction I'd like to go. And then as I did that color, it settled on a warm tone. I took my initial drawing and then I started adding it to the color to start to see how that would all pull together. And little by little, I started to, it's, it sort of comes alive. After a while, I'm starting to add elements and it's beginning to really come take shape for me, which is really good. This is a more detailed part of that uh, development in a sense. I even starting to use paint in a small way to kind of capture a feeling. I'm still thinking now, this is gonna be an oil painting. How do I interpret that? How does this come together uh, on a large canvas? So I take a drawing like this. Once I got my direction, I, tr I enlarge it on just a line drawing of the piece on a large canvas, a 30 by 40 canvas, transfer it to the canvas. Once I have a line drawing on the canvas and I have my color sketches there, then I can make my palette, mix up my colors on the palette and start working out, putting in tones, over top of tones and just kind of working out my light and shade areas. And this, comes into the finish. I had to wind up coming in. And once I get to this point in the painting, it's still not finished in there. I, I look at that, I go back and forth with it. Uh, it's, a painting like this usually could take four weeks, four or five weeks going back and forth on it, but it kind of grew for me. I got to know her and that was the thing, getting to know someone, you start painting and all of a sudden she's very familiar with me. Uh, her dance, her creative soul, all of that became part of me. I just really loved uh, getting a sense of who she was as a person, and that's what I wanted to capture. And so it's sort of like adding the various things, going from uh, her youth to her dance uh, career, her dance teaching career, and just capturing those kind of elements. It was just kind of a nice growing process for me. So I kind of just got into it and wanted to one of the key things, of course, was her getting a sense of who she was as a person. And of course, creating this part of it, capturing her eyes, capturing, and I got a lot of this from the photos I was, I just sort of created too. I wanted to put as much as what I felt she was about. It was something that uh, I began to, to, to get so familiar with her and understand her life as a dancer what that meant to her, her life as a creative person. It sort of inspired me as a painter. So that's what she did, this whole process, this whole uh, doing the portrait, uh, when meant so much to me at that time and now, of course. But it was, it was just a, a project of love. I just enjoyed it. It was fun and it was, you know, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Al. I feel like you captured her spirit. It's beautiful. Um, if you want to look at a reproduction of the entire work, uh, we have it back in our display area, which you can see after the presentation. Next, we will be viewing a clip from Space Needle, A Hidden History by B.J. Bullard. 
BJ's film work is about shining a light on hidden histories in Seattle. It was through her research for this film that BJ first discovered Sevilla Fort, who had faded from Seattle history. The film project brought together many people excited to revive Sevilla's legacy and in many ways was a catalyst for the event tonight.
Thank you. That was radiant. Wow. Uh, so what you just watched is Hidden in Pl Plain Sight, which was performed and choreographed by Nia Amina Minor and Akoya Harris to original music composed by cellist Gretchen Yanover. For more information about Gretchen's music, you can vi visit GretchenYanover.com. This piece is an excerpt of a larger work titled Sevilla, A Practice of Return, co-created by the Black Collectivity Project. A Practice of Return is set to premiere in spring 2023. Under the guiding notion, we build black collectivity out of necessity, artists Nia Amina Minor, Akoya Harris, David Rue, and Marco Ferroni envision a public program in three parts, part ar archival project, part movement research, and part community offering. A Practice of Return finds it, it's, find, finds it in, its impetus in the history of black dance in Seattle, beginning with Sevilla Ford. The aim of the work is to enact black collectivity as necessary site of return, a practice of looking back to see where you are. This project was developed with support from Velocity Dance Center made in Seattle, a residency program, the Incarev Black Woman Residency Program and the Henry Art Gallery. It will culminate in spring 2023 with a public program presented by Velocity Dance Center. For more information, you can visit velocitydancecenter.org. Next, as we finish setting up, um, we're going to dive into Sevilla Fort's legacy through a panel discussion moderated by Jasmine Mahmood. Panelists will include BJ Bullard, Edna DeGray, Nia Amina Minor, and Stephanie Johnson Tolliver. More information on all the panelists and the moderator can be found in your programs. I think we're ready now to welcome the panelists up to the stage. Hi everyone, how's everyone doing tonight? Good. My name is Jasmine, I'm really honored to be moderating this panel. We're waiting for the amazing Nia Amina, but I wanna just give it up to all of our panelists. I feel like we're in room with legends tonight, so can we give a round of applause to all of our panelists? And as Rachel said, I encourage you to read more about folks' bios and the beautiful programs we have. So we'll just wait about two more minutes and then we'll get started. Edna, you were incredible. I know, I'm, I'm loving this full house. <laughs> Good. I don't know if my amps will be the same. <laughs> Hi. Oh. Hi, Nia Amina. Can we give another round of applause for you? <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> Great. So we'll begin the panel tonight. And again, I encourage you to read folks' bios in our program. Um, to start, I just wanted to say I reached out to a friend of mine named Joanna Dadas, who wrote a book about Catherine Dunham. Um, to say more about Sevilla Fort, and she just wrote me recently um, a quote from her. Sevilla Fort was central to the training of actors and dancers in New York in the mid 20th century, first as the dance director of the highly influential Catherine Denham School, then as the owner operator of her own school. Fort educated an entire generation of performers, including but not limited to James Dean, Eartha Kitt, and Michael Bennett, who choreographed a chorus line. Without Fort, the Dunham technique would not have been wide, had such a widespread impact on modern dance, jazz dance, 
Broadway and Hollywood. So I just wanted to share with you that to start us this conversation and think about the reach of Seville Fort within and beyond Seattle. Um, I have four questions for our panelists and I'm gonna open it up to you all uh, to continue our conversation. So first my question is for Ms. Edna de Grey who met uh, Seville Fort. I just would love to hear more about that experience. You were talking about that in your session. Just anything else you wanna share about that amazing experience? Yes, um, one of the things that, uh, that I can remember when I arrived in Seattle in 1974, I wanted to open a dance studio, but I started with a place called Black Arts West, which was, which was in the central area of, of Seattle, and it was a, uh, they call it the Camp Firehouse. But anyway, I opened my own dance studio, but um, I opened it for, because I had a passion for dance. I didn't have a lot of uh, what you call professional uh, dance experience before then. I was more into healthcare and wellness. So after opening the dance studio, in 1974 and meeting Bill Monroe and going to New York and being able to meet and see and learn more about Sevilla Ford, I came back with a passion and a purpose for my dance studio. And um, I wanted it to be, um, a wajo means com come and dance. That means everyone is for the community. And I also felt like dance was like a healing power. It, it's healthy. Uh, it's, uh, and I want it for everyone. I didn't want it just for uh, a profession, professional dancers or people striving to become professional dancers. I wanted to be uh, diverse uh, because I learned that in Sevilla's early childhood in Seattle, there was a lot of racism, you know. She couldn't uh, stay in Seattle and, and perform. She had to leave Seattle in order to become a professional dancer, which she hooked up with Catherine Dunham. But the idea that uh, she had trained so much in dance and education, and like her brother said, in, in music also, but she was denied any dance companies here in Seattle, any dance schools, they were very limited. And so most of her dancing was either private in the home, uh, and so she usually uh, liked dance so much and tried to pass it on, even from an early age. She was teaching dance to a lot of young people in the community in the central area. And uh, the, the people that I remember most was Millie Russell and uh, Eula Gayton. And they told me a lot about taking classes from Sevilla when they were young, and Sevilla was young too. So what I'm saying is she shared her passion for dance at a very early age. and. Uh, but the idea of her leaving Seattle in order to be able to um, perform and extend her career was sort of sad. Uh, what I did like and would like to remember about Sevilla Ford was her passion for dance and her gift for dance and how she brought many people from diverse backgrounds together. She sort of made up for the time that she was denied in Seattle to become a dancer or to become a professional dancer. So when she opened her studio in New York, she had all kinds of people coming there. And as you see, there was even people who are like, became movie stars. But they were people who, who were not interested in uh, anything except dance at that time, you know? And she wasn't teaching dance for dance. Say she taught dance like, um, self-discovery, uh, like, like, like the fact that Bill Monroe says, I could never do a pirouette. I go to these schools and, and nobody pays me any attention, nobody. But the moment he goes into Sevilla and he says, I can't do this, Sevilla would softly say, you can do this and I can teach you. In other words, she took the time and, the, and, and all of her passion and all of her gift to teach people who normally would not Nobody probably paid any attention, period. You know, they just would be uh, people that would come to class for years and nobody ever pays them any attention. Sevilla gave everything. So when I, like I said before, my whole studio, Washington, was based on that. So it, the, make a long story very short, she was a mentor to me. I mentored her in what she did. 
I wanted to become, uh, I sort of walked in a footstep because in Seattle, I didn't, I felt like I was not well supported in a, in a sense of what I was trying to do in terms of the community. And I did uh, bring in artists like, um, my last artist I will always remember was Kathy Mitchell. He stayed and Bill Monroe stayed. Most of the artists come here, there is no place for them to, to dance or to perform. Uh, Kathy found a, a nice outlet and became a great professional dancer and gave a lot to the community. And the other person is, um, the one that I, I'm, I'm thinking of now is uh, Spectrum. Spectrum has really brought a lot to our community also. So anyway, to make a long story short, I really, really enjoyed meeting Sevilla Ford. I, I, without her, without that mentorship and, and seeing a black dancer having some of the same problems I have, I would probably have given up a long time ago as far as dance in Seattle, you know, and working with the community. Because financially, it's very, it was not very supported. But anyway, I felt like it was worth going and for what, 25, 30 years. Thank you, Ms. Adna. <laughs> My next question is thinking about when we study Seville for and often when we study black arts and black women, there's often these gaps in the archive. So I'm curious with each of you, when you've approached researching her um, and how she's influenced your work, what are those gaps in the archive? What do we not know that you want to know more when we think about Seville Fort? Yeah, I know the gaps in the archive, right? Well, let me breathe and <laughs> before I get started on that topic, because um, you know many of the the large libraries and even some of the um, smaller um, historic societies, like the Black Heritage Society, um, we set our our tone. Um, the the archives um, are created narratives; they're controlled narratives. And sometimes uh, we do have the flexibility and at the Black Heritage Society, we're pretty specific about what we collect. Mm -hmm. But um, some of the larger archives uh, can step back and, and open the door and invite these narratives. The people that are doing the, the black memory work um, now, and you'll see a lot more of it um, as there's a lot of activity across a lot of social media where there are people who are not um, you know, certified archivists, or, but they're doing the work. And all of that work can contribute to fill in the gap. So I would invite everyone to just get involved in that and be your history keepers and be the keepers of, of our history. And um, let's fill in the gaps for Sevilla. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that um, in large part because of Ms. Edna and BJ, through the Space Needle film was how I found out about Sevilla Fort. Mm -hmm. And then I think a sort of curiosity, I'm someone who loves history, I love memory work, I love digging around in the archives, I love going on rabbit holes and diving in and finding what I can find. And in the research I was doing around Sevilla Fort, exactly what you're saying, going to mm -hmm. the more institutional, traditional routes, I wasn't finding um, what I thought should be there. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, I think, a friend of, of mine through the Black Collectivity Project, David Rue, had a friend of a friend, Chieko, who actually said, you should check the Northwest Enterprise, the black newspapers mm -hmm. of that time and era. Um, we had no idea, I had no idea, especially being someone who's not born and raised here, but came here, I had no idea to think about looking at black newspapers. But in the 30s and 40s, black newspapers were the memory keepers. And mm -hmm. there are ads in the newspaper of her teaching class to little kids. There's, you know, uh, social comments about her birthday party, graduation. Uh, the only review of her solo concert that I could find was done through the Northwest Enterprise. And so the gaps that I saw in the, in the institutional and traditional archives, I sort of began to string along a, a sort of very, you know, shallow narrative, but a picture of what her life and legacy might have been like here mm -hmm. before she left. And I think that, um, I, I certainly think her presence on the East Coast is known and felt. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had conversations with many dancers who are like, oh yeah, Seville Ford? And, 
you know, on the opposite end of that, I've had conversations with folks here and they've been like, I haven't heard. I want to know more, but I haven't heard. Um, so I do think there's a, you know, there's a thing of keeping memory, especially in the dance world, that tends to happen through the movement lineage of like teacher to student. There's a way that dancers pass memory, pass knowledge, pass history through the body. And, and we sort of have an understanding of some of the lineages that we carry, even in a simple movement or pose or phrase. Um, but I think in these traditional modes, these more recognizable ones, especially verbal and visible, um, there isn't, there isn't much, there's, there's much to be done. Mm. Yeah. Right. And, and I just, just really quickly too, that the, um, um, just get this back on, just really quickly to, to build on that is that um, the oral history and the storytelling and the passing of the stories um, is so important and I know that when I was invited to this really beautiful table to be part of this program um, I, I started digging a little deeper and some of the stories were coming out right so Bev Kelly why is she not here tonight just, just like Bev Kelly is like all over Seattle really uh, beautiful black woman who just turned 90 uh, I think last week and um, she told me a story about Sevilla being her babysitter and um, how her mother did day work and couldn't uh, watch her all day, but she would leave her with Sevilla, and Sevilla would try to teach her these steps, and she was just like, you know, I I'm not about that, Sevilla, I can't do it. And then, of course, like, you know, and you were saying she was encouraging her and encouraging her, and, and uh, the, a past president of the Black Heritage Society, uh, the Reverend Phyllis Beaumonte, took dance lessons from Sevilla for it. So all of these stories are forming, and. Um, I absolutely love that as we can begin to fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and for me, uh, I came to discover Sevilla Fort by researching um, um, the Space Needle and the origins of the Space Needle and who put the curve in the needle. And that led me to Victor Steinberg's personal diary where he said that um, what gave him the shape for the needle, the inspiration, was a sculpture called the feminine one. Mm -hmm. And so then I started drilling down into the origin of that sculpture and the artist. And it turns out in the 1940s and the 1930s, um, Cornish was really this gathering place where artists and dancers and architects and the creative community of Seattle, um, which was you know, black and white together, gay and straight together, they came together and they influenced each other and they knew each other. And Victor Steinbrook, the man who put the curve in the needle, um, he was, he, he knew Sevilla Ford. So in the film, I made a kind of a, a little bit of a leap, but I made the leap at a time in, the in 2018, 2019, when I had hyper awareness of the need to give voice to the hidden histories in our hometown. I didn't know about Sevilla, um, but when I began to learn and talk to uh, Edna and we would have these collaborative dinners around a table with a, with a view of the Space Needle, we got together and we started thinking, well, how can we not just redefine this icon of the region at, reclaiming the feminine origin of a dancer, but who could that dancer have been? And that led me down the rabbit hole of Sevilla and learning, I'm a, I grew up in Seattle, I didn't know about Sevilla Fort. I mean, the archives are segregated, you know, they capture the segregation of the time. Um, so I was just, you know, once I, once I got it together and <laughs> started making these connections, then I was able to commission poetry by Jordan Imani Keith, and I was able to um, invite, you know, uh, the dance movement artist Nia Mina to uh, put together, bring that poetry and that music alive through movement. And it's my goal that when people look at the Space Needle today, they will see it as Sevilla Fort in concrete. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful, that's absolutely beautiful. And it ties in really well with this next question about Sevilla Fort's contributions to Seattle. I'm so curious for each of you to articulate that, especially because, um, Niamina, you kind of named this, Miss Edna, you named this, 
the archive of Sevilla Fort, there's so much of her archive in New York City when we think about kind of these dance histories. What are her contributions to this city um, where she was born and raised? I don't know, she, uh, Sevilla leaves a, a beautiful legacy here in Seattle. Um, she, she lived, her family lived in uh, North Seattle but um, during the, the 30s and, and into the 40s, um, the Central District and particularly along the Madison um, Street Corridor was the hub of, of black business and activity. And she did teach in uh, Chandler Hall that was a, a building that was just a little bit um, south of Madison Street. And she would bring young people in, in and um, try to teach them movement, and um, so she was really inspired at a really early age to give back in the community, and I think that's, um, you know, a strong um, attribute of hers is the, the giving back and, and the teaching, and I think there was some reference to it in the, the film clip that we saw, and um, she, she was inspired um, to then go and, and participate and perform with the Negro Repertory Theater, the Seattle Repertory Theater. Um, she danced, she created movement for them. Uh, so she has a really beautiful legacy and um, it would be our honor at BHS to keep building on that and mm -hmm. uh, control the narrative. Yeah, one thing that struck me in that I kept coming back to, I think, just as an artist, was her time at Cornish, the cohort she was a part of, mm -hmm. um, sort of, you know, under, you know, the tutelage of Bonnie Bird, and that it was her, Merce Cunningham, and Dorothy Herman, <clears throat> and the cohort was really small, mm -hmm. and so they became Bonnie Bird, the group, and uh, they danced all over the region. So as a young artist, the is having professional experience in a company, under a person who danced for Graham. And you know, we, we understand the sort of you know, trajectory of Merce Cunningham thereafter, but there's some things that Sevilla does here in terms of her solo concert and what she's able to bring together, both like community members from the black community in Seattle and this modern art movement that's happening around the 20s and 30s and 40s. And she's really very much a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know, when we consider like modern artists of that era, <clears throat> we often think of the John Cages and the Merce Cunninghams. It's really interesting for me to think about her here building work that's bringing African diasporic movement, black vernacular, black social dance into modern um, and trying to maybe express herself as a young black person in this sort of turn of the era mm -hmm. of the 30s, this, this sort of, you know, pre-war, you know, post-depression, carving out her space as a modern young person. And in that solo concert, you know, she, she and John Cage collaborate and he does his pr first prepared piano in response to her need for percussive elements, right? A and how do you achieve that when you can't, but there's not enough space for all the drummers. You only have the piano and my body and you know, what can we come up with? And there's not much about that night. There's a program that I found in John Cage's archives at Northwestern because his mom kept a scrapbook of his early stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> and, you know, I'm sort of looking at the program, trying to just imagine the night, like what this must have been like. It took place at uh, a theater that's still on the Ave um, in the University District. Uh, I'm just Cornish, trying. Cornish <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just imagining her being in that space, her being off Madison teaching class, moving around, going to rehearsals for the Negro Repertory Company, moving in all these spaces in little old Seattle in the 30s. <laughs> not you many know, black folks at that time. Not many black folks. Um, if you see back there in our display, there's a picture of her dancing um, with a jazz sort of ensemble as a part of the Negro Company. So it's really interesting to think that she really was carving out her vernacular expression as a concert dance artist. She then leaves, goes to LA, and then joins the Dunham Company. And I can only think that must have been monumental for her. Mm -hmm. She's able to come back to Seattle, perform at the Moor in her hometown two years later, yeah. 
and there's a program back there that we have, and she's in the program. She's, you know, in multiple pieces. She's with the company. Um, and so these sort of things are really exciting for me. And, you know, then she spreads her wings and moves on to New York. So we can understand that she has this imprint here. It's tangible. And all we have to do is sort of uncover it a little bit. And it, it really excites me as an artist, you know, to, to sort of do that work, to return back to the past to uncover in order to, to move forward. And that's definitely what the project that I'm working on is, is looking at. And you know, one of the things I think about Sevilla is I think that in, in some ways she's very much like the best of Seattle. Um, creative, engaged with her community, not arrogant, not stuck up, you know. <laughs> Um, very welcoming, encouraging, just like Edna was saying, and actually Edna's kind of like this, you know, um, inviting people to, to, you know, instead of like telling somebody they're, they're clumsy and an oaf, you know, um, you encourage them to, <laughs> to be their best. And that spirit as a teacher, I really admire in, um, in Sevilla Fort because it lives on in the students that she had and the people that she's inspired. Like this Thank gal you. over here. <laughs> and that one over there. And that one over there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I like to think of that as a spiritual part of me is, is the Villa Fort, you know. Yeah. And so if you think of the Space Needle in that way, <laughs> as this as this entity that could be welcoming people from around the world and from the community, a unifying presence. Mm -hmm. And you imagine that spirit of Sevilla Fort as a kind, creative, thoughtful, patient being. You know, I like to think of the space needle that way as, uh, as something that's very unique to this region, but something that captures this, you know, the, the spirit of the good part of Seattle. You know, just my take. Great. My, my last question, and I'll open it up. I do want to just honor all of the historical and archival work that each of you has done. Nia, Amina, the kind mm. of these like digging into the archives and finding these moments. Um, Stephanie, with your work with the Black Historical Society, BJ, this film, and, and Edna, kind of your long history of these repertoires that you've yeah. brought to our city and kind of continue to instill in our bodies. So I want to honor that and use that um, as a way to ask how can we best honor Sevilla Fort's legacy? What are the things that we can do? Keep the fire burning. <laughs> In other words, through workshops, uh, classes, presentations, uh, honor her birthday. Uh, just keep the fire burning in that way. That's what we mean by that, you know, mm -hmm. because like you said, nobody really knew who Sevilla Fort was. So what we're trying to do is put a little oxygen there, light it up, and just try to keep it going. And we can do this. We can do this through our classes, special birthday. I know she has a birthday. We can celebrate that. We could do uh, bring the Dunham's technique back to the younger generation who knows nothing about Catherine Dunham. Mm -hmm. Even though we think of Catherine Dunham, I think of her as also a person who should be a little bit more well known because when you think of her, all of the, uh, oh, what's his name, Michael Bennett, all of that, like, chorus line, all of those dance and Broadway musicals, the dances were started, the isolation movement, da, da, all of that was, was, was put out by Catherine Dunham, because she would take every part of your body, every joint in your body, and move it. I like to think of um, the, the, the technique alone is a healing process. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it heals the body, the mind and the spirit. So if you're just sitting there and you're about to fall over, just sort of roll your shoulders back a little and take a deep breath and think about Sevilla Fort or Catherine Dunham. Okay. That's awesome. Right. I think um, that, that everyone here tonight, if you just take away what you heard, you know, tonight and share it with one more person and one more person and one more person, and speak her name. And then um, I wanna say to, to Raymond, that is just a really beautiful thing that Cornish is gonna do, and um, the scholarship at Cornish, uh, that's really beautiful. So um, the more we can do like 
gather together like this, um, uh, whether it's in programming, beautiful dance, um, Okoye, it's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, uh, so I just say more of this and sharing more of this is, is what we do to um, you know, pay tribute to Savella. And we have something to look forward to in the spring of right. uh, 2023, correct? Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, that's, that's a way to keep her memory alive and as a living practice. Yeah. yeah. And I think to your point about living practice, I think we can honor Sevilla, honoring the artists that are here now, mm -hmm. that are connected to that lineage, go to shows. Yeah. You know, I think we're in a place where we have had a really tumultuous two years and, it, and, it's, and it's continuing and the ways that you can show up, show up. I think folks <clears throat> don't realize the impact that the live arts has felt over the past mm -hmm. two, three years. We're recouping and recovering and artists are trying hard. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, the live arts can't happen unless we're together. The ways that you can show up, show up to support those artists who are a part of this lineage, mm -hmm. part of this history, and part of the continuum. And um, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, thank you so much. And I'm going to open it up now to our audience. Uh, feel free to, because we have a microphone with Rachel. Yes. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, and someone with a microphone will come and find you. There's two of us, so. If you're on that side, Alexander's got a mic for you. Hi, thanks so much for this really rich uh, discussion um, and your performances. Thank you all. Um, I'd love to hear more, if you know, about um, Sevilla's movement influences in addition to Catherine Dunham. Uh, we didn't get to see her dance, and we saw you and Akoya dance, and I'm curious how much you were drawing on her movement versus your own, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it there. Like, what did she bring in addition to the Dunning, Dunham technique to her movement style? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> from my understanding, um, and also I think, you know, as a dancer, just do constantly doing movement research, looking back, diving into the history of modern dance, diving into the history of black social dance of the era, we can understand that the things that were happening within the black community were certainly influencing her. So with the Negro Rep Company, the movement that's happening socially in the black communities around the 30s and 40s is present here in Seattle. We know that the music is present. We know she's responding in that sense. And then we also know that she's at Cornish under Bonnie Bird, who is a dancer with Graham. So we understand that there's a Martha Graham influence pop potentially, and that this is the 30s, so if Sevilla and a cohort of students are dancing barefoot, that's a big deal. <laughs> it's not a big deal for us anymore, but if you're on stage dancing barefoot, um, working with abstract ideas in the 30s and 40s, that's huge. And so <clears throat> I think thinking back, you know, it's like Akoya and I were laughing, we're, we're trying to condense 100 years of modern dance history, <laughs> you know, into seven minutes. And, and it's, you know, it's an exercise that I think the body can do. It's hard to talk about it because it can, you know, be too much to, to hold, but the body can, you know, there are certain shapes and things um, that we understand as, in the trajectory through modern dance. Um, a part of our research, we were looking in archive, looking for images um, and using those images uh, to create sort of tableaus and give them three dimensionality. So mm -hmm. some of the positions are, are positions that we are borrowing from the images that we have of her. And they're also positions that we're borrowing from the images of other black dancers that are in the archive um, that we could find. Um, there were a couple, there are actually some folks here, Miss Heather. We found a photo of Miss Heather dancing with Spectrum Dance Theater. Oh. And uh, you know, there's, there's these, these arms that, that we see from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. You know, I mean, it's, these things feel very simple to us, you know, this carriage of the body, but I think that there is story and memory in carriage of the body, and we're, we're tapping into that just to, you know, explore through movement. Um, like I said, it gets, it gets convoluted with words, but, you know, you can go into a Graham class, you can go into a Horton class, you can go to Ailey, you can, you know, you know be here talking about Sevilla, moving the body in a certain way and, and dancers can understand where we are. What era is this? What style is this? What vernacular is this? 
um, without saying very much. <laughs> so that, it was, that's a little bit of what we were trying to do. That's why you're the artist. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Was there another question? Other questions? Thank you so much for tonight. This is just a wonderful evening and I feel so privileged to, to be here with all of you and to be learning about Sevilla. Um, my daughter is a dancer and I would love for her to be learning about Sevilla Fort and I'm wondering what resources or where you can point me so that I can share this with her and other young dancers. So the question was, what resources can we point folks to, to learn more about Sevilla Fort? Well, after this event, everyone that will attended will get a resource document as a part of the thank you email. And there will be some links that you can, you know, search through. We also have DJ Film. We also have Al Doggett's paintings. And these are responses that artists have made about her history. And so I think in supporting these artists and also searching on the research doc and that those are ways that you can certainly mm -hmm. teach your young person. Any other questions? All right, one more question right here. Um, I appreciate all the work that everybody has done on this. Um, we were responsible to the past, and oftentimes we are very careless with our history. And um, I'm always thrilled when people are willing to do the hard work. And I, this is mostly right now a question for Nia Amina. I know that um, you're not from here, and so all of this is fresh to you in a way that it isn't to the people who grew up here. Is there anything in particular that you've come across as you've been digging, digging, digging that just knocked you flat, that was a surprise? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I was just gonna add to the last thing that you should certainly follow the Black Heritage Society if you're not already aware of the work they do in terms of finding history. It's a great place for a young person to come and learn. learn. Yeah. Um, I honestly, the Northwest Enterprise knocked me flat. It knocked me flat. I just typed in her name and then it was like, it was everywhere. It was ads for her classes. It was, you know, articles about this, a performance she did with another artist here and here. And so, I mean, the black newspapers as a source of memory keeping is, is, is really important for us to hold and, and, and access. Um, and that, that really knocked me flat because I think we felt a little bit like we were, um, really in the void. <clears throat> and actually, we, we just heard Fadia Hartman speak last night about the void, and we really felt like we were just sort of swimming in the void and, and really trying to reach out to something tangible. And with this one, through community, one person saying, I know you're not from here, but there are these black newspapers from this era. You should go there and find them. And I'm so appreciative of that. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, that mm -hmm. really knocked me flat. I agree. Getting lost, and you mentioned the rabbit hole. I go down every day. Um, is uh, the newspapers um, and to be able to access them digitally um, it, it's huge now what you can discover there but what I'll tell you too is that at the Black Heritage Society we have the original uh, copies of the Northwest Enterprise um, and other newspapers where you can come and handle them with white gloves <laughs> turn the pages and and look at some of those stories. And um, really interesting that you said, because it, they would say things um, in the newspaper like, uh, Mrs. Jones went back east to see her aunt who had the flu. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Right. Um, but there would also be these really great um, pieces about people who entertained, the orators who were coming to town, um, just really solid information about the community. 
So um, if you're so inclined um, to uh, and want to touch those papers, um, you can <laughs> make an appointment and come down, but um, they are certainly available, uh, digital uh, formats. Great. Well, this panel's been amazing. Ms. Edna DeGray, BJ Buller, uh, Stephanie Johnson Tolliver, and Yamina Minor. Can we give our panelists a big round of applause? <laughs> And a big round of applause for our moderator as well. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who came out tonight. Um, I was just thinking about what Nia Mina was saying about live productions and live arts. It doesn't happen without an audience. And this wouldn't be the same without an audience either. And all of you taking the knowledge that the wonderful, amazing people who've been up on the stage here today um, have shared and then bringing it forth. So thank you all for coming. Um, I just, I feel like we've been graced with so much tonight. Um, and I really feel like the spirit of Sevilla Fort is continuing and um, that the legacy will, will, will keep going. So thank you. Uh, just a couple more things. Um, we have these programs. Please take your program home to remember the night. Um, if you flip it over, you'll also see that there's a QR code. We have a survey <laughs> that can be accessed through that. Um, and we'd love you to take it so we can um, keep, continue to improve our offerings. And we're offering a prize raffle for taking part, so it's just five minutes. <laughs> um, second, before you leave, slash on your way out, make sure to see the display um, as was mentioned there's a program uh, that Sevilla Fort was in, there's uh, a beautiful postcard, um, you can see Al's piece, a reproduction of that, as well as we've got some iPads uh, with uh, different photos of Sevilla. So make sure to check that out, our store is open as well. Um, and then mark your calendars for spring 2023. We don't have a date yet, right? But check the Velocity Dance Center website um, to come see more and continue learning about Sevilla Fort. Finally, we hope, you to, hope to see you back in the museum soon and check out mohai.org for more mohai programming. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening and be safe on your way home.